Break Hard Podcast back for another week. We had NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series in Atlanta, and we had the Truck Series at Mid-Ohio, as well as Formula One at Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. Pretty busy weekend of racing, if we're being completely honest. Like, we're just missing IndyCar, which we'll get back next weekend in Toronto. But overall, pretty solid weekend, if we're being completely honest. The Truck Series race at Mid-Ohio had rain. It had a little bit of everything. Uh, it was actually pretty decent. There was an ARCA race as well on Friday evening at Mid-Ohio, which resulted in one of the drivers getting suspended for intentionally waiting on his teammate. We'll get to that in a little while. The Xfinity race on Saturday night, really solid. Xfinity continues to deliver week in and week out. And there's one part of that Xfinity race I'll talk about in a little bit that I think could be the future of Atlanta, at least going forward. The cup race was potentially the best not, not, it wasn't the best cup race of the season. I'm not going to go there because uh, Kansas was still better than that, and I still think Montana was better than this because this was, uh, it's manufactured, right? It's semi artificial, at least in terms of the racing, because it is a super speedway and it's whatever. We'll get into that. But really solid race there, unfortunately, cut short due to rain. And then we also had the Formula One race at Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. Turned out to actually be good. Max still won, still won. Got his six in a row, like he's on the cover of Rocky Six, but he just continues to get it done. However, McLaren was actually closer. Pretty interesting race there. We'll get into that. So let's start with the cup race in Atlanta. All right, cup race in Atlanta. I guess the biggest question coming out of this, and obviously William Byron ends up winning the race, gets to wear his big funny hat and victory lane, which was in the media center. But at the same time, the biggest question to come out of this race was, did NASCAR give up too quickly when it came to the rain there at the end of the race? And you, when I say gave up too quickly, I understand that the race started at 7 p.m. Obviously, it's a Sunday night race. They were going to dry the track. Like, this happened at... Uh, what, a little after 9.30, it was 2 hours and 25 minutes, I think, uh, was the official race length. So obviously that happened around 9.45 is when the race was finally called. And you're not going to dry the track, wait out the rain, wait out the rain, then dry the track. You try to dry it before the rain's done, that's just uh, redundant, it doesn't work. But if you wait out the rain, then try to dry the track, we're not getting done until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and that's just not worth it. Race is past halfway, so you can't delay it because it's an official race, unlike last week in Chicago, but that's we're not here to talk about that. The biggest question I think that a lot of people were upset about was when the caution came out on lap 178 with Ryan Priest and Bubba Wallace, NASCAR continued to put around under caution, and NASCAR lists the amount of cautions, the amount of caution laps rather, as only seven. I'll have to go back and watch it because it felt like a long time. I mean, by the time they put the cars on pit road to red flag the race, it was 15 minutes from the time that caution first came out because I went back and looked at the timestamps on Twitter to see when the caution was first reported and when we finally put on the pit road. If they had opened pit road in a timely manner, and they didn't open pit road because the pace car driver kept reporting raindrops on the windshield, even though they never turned the windshield wipers on. So they're reporting raindrops on the windshield. NASCAR won't open pit road because they're trying to decide if they're going to red flag the race. And if they do, that's the end of the race. So uh, they kind of learned their lesson in 2019 at the Summer Daytona race. Summer Daytona is really kind of the catalyst to all of this. So they learned their lesson in the Summer Daytona race in 2019 when they opened pit road up with weather impending. That allowed Kurt Busch and others to pit. And then they never went green again. So it cost Kurt a win and was handed, handed it to Justin Haley, which... I think in that situation as well, NASCAR pulled the trigger pretty quickly and just ended the race because they understood that giving the win to Justin Haley didn't affect the playoffs and Kurt couldn't be mad that somebody else got locked in. So that was a whole thing. Having said all of that, not that Kurt, whatever, you guys understand. But having said all of that, um, 
they obviously put it around under caution this time because they didn't necessarily want the cars to pit and go back to green flag racing after what happened at the summer daytona race last year when they sent the whole field off into turn one and wrecked half the field austin Dillon's ends up winning the race and everybody was all pissed off fans drivers owners people were not happy so in theory like if they open pit road immediately right after that caution comes out and try to make it a quick yellow because both cars drove away it wasn't like they needed to go out and retrieve the cars they could have pitted, got the cars back out on track, and then potentially have had, if there is that 15 minute window like I was referencing, referencing, they could have had seven more minutes of racing. That's 14 laps. Even if you only get 10 more laps of racing, it's still something. And it's hard because obviously William Byron winning the race doesn't affect somebody else locking in, right? It just helps him take the regular season points lead. Now he has the most wins heading into the playoffs. At the same time, guys like AJ Allmendinger, Michael McDowell, Brad Keselowski, they needed this race to go back green, Daniel Suarez included, to try to make up that ground because they need to win this race to lock in. Michael McDowell, obviously, in a roundabout way, ended up benefiting from this race being red flagged and ultimately ended because he finishes third, takes a big points day, and moves himself right now into a playoff spot by pointing his way in, knocking Alex Bowman out. On the flip side, if they do allow those cars to pit, he has to pit because he's almost out of fuel. He went 91 laps on fuel, which is absolutely unheard of. Granted, there are some cautions in there. So if he pits, he obviously is going to go to the back. And if they do only run 10 laps, chances are he's not getting to the lead. I mean, Brad Kozlowski and Denny Hamlin both drove their balls off and got pretty far up after they had pitted the caution before, but they didn't get back to the, well, Brad didn't get back to the lead. And Denny, I think only ever made it up to like seventh or, or so. I'll double check that because again, we come for a statistically sound podcast. That's what the listeners request. That's what the listeners get. The name of this race, though, also low key kind of funny, was the all or not the all state Quaker State 400 available at Walmart. I haven't been to Walmart in a while, but if I walk in and this race isn't fucking available, I'm about to be pissed. I think I guess Quaker State's the only thing available. Uh, Denny finished 14th. I guess he got shuffled out there at the end. Joey Logano looked pretty strong early. Hang on, not not going to not going to Joey real quick. Back to the original point. So obviously, if Michael pitted, he ends up not having a good points day and can't win the race. But at the same time, I don't know if you can let that dictate what you do in terms of race control and race control made some questionable decisions again it's consistently inconsistent right they were consistent last night when people wrecked they weren't throwing cautions right away but at the same time the Noah Gragson incident I can't remember who he bounced off the wall with maybe I don't know either way that incident they typically always throw a caution for the Kevin Harvick spinning out that's always a caution right more often than not I don't think it should be a caution because he kept going but NASCAR typically always throws a caution. NASCAR throws cautions for cars just getting loose sometimes just because they want to throw a caution. Not on Sunday night, they didn't. Kevin Harvick spins out, no caution. That Gregson incident that I referenced, no caution. It's just inconsistencies, right? And I'm not saying it's wrong because they knew weather was coming. They wanted to keep this race green. And I agree with that. And I'm glad they made that call. But that should just be sort of the standard across the board. Like if this happens next weekend at New Hampshire, somebody spins out in turn one and they get rolling before the leaders come back around, shouldn't be a caution, you know, regardless of who it is. So I think all of that kind of played into a factor. But I mean, I can see the NASCAR side of this being like, we don't want to go back green to send everybody off into turn one or turn three or wherever and have it be raining on one of the laps. I get that completely understand but by the time they red flagged the race and had the cars on pit road and people were loading uh, or covering the cars up with um the car covers uh, that's when it really started to rain so again you you could have got some more laps in which maybe it's arbitrary right maybe they just go out and wreck and we're back under caution again immediately uh but i think a lot of fans were pissed off one because that caution period felt so long because it felt like they were just waiting for a lightning strike or waiting for the rain to come because there's nothing really happening and people will be like oh it's actually raining pretty hard you have to remember too the way these cameras are looking especially towards lights and everything they're looking across the entire track and then they're picking up all those raindrops that are in the lights. so it looks like it's raining a lot harder than it actually is most times but i think a lot of fans were upset not only because we just kind of put it around for 15 minutes like it was macy's thanksgiving day parade but i think they're also mad at the fact 
that it was a really intense race up until that point, and they wanted to see more of it, right? You gave them a taste, and then they wanted the whole thing, and instead they only got, like, 278 or something like that miles out of the 400. Does it actually tell you on here? Um, why wouldn't it do that? Racing reference. I know racing reference isn't doing too well right now, right? It's like on its last leg. It's trying to be revived. Range shortened to 185 laps. 185 times. I don't, I'll be honest with you guys. My brain's not 100% today. At least when it comes to math. 277. I was really freaking close. So shout out to my brain for actually being there. Uh, they got 277 miles of their 400 miles. Uh, I get why people are angry, right? So we will, I guess, be angry about that because as great as Chicago was in a success, it's very NASCAR for them to go into the next weekend and just piss off the whole fan base. But I understand both sides of it. I get it. Uh, it's just unfortunate because I think we all wanted to see how that race was going to play out. But in a sense, I think it does help for help sell tickets at least for next year's race if they do have two at Atlanta once again, which I imagine that they probably will. It's not like Kentucky's come back on the schedule. And I don't see SMI trying to run a street course anywhere or doing anything like that. So I imagine Atlanta will be back for two races. Uh, it has to help to sell that, though. I am interested to see what the ratings are for this race having started at 7.20 p.m. East Coast time. And I saw a bunch of people being like, oh, well, if they started this race, you know, at 5 o'clock, it goes green to the end. I don't disagree. NASCAR and NBC, here's the thing. If NBC is willing to give NASCAR a prime time slot on Sunday night, NASCAR is taking it 11 out of 10 times. They're never going to pass on that. So... We can just kind of negate that conversation right now. Yeah, I agree with you. If they started at 5, it goes to the end. But again, if they started at 5, fans are complaining that they're starting to race at 5. If they started at 7 and it goes green to the end, people aren't really that mad. Some people, I saw people complaining at Nashville two weeks ago that the race ended too late. The race ended just after 10 o'clock East Coast time. I don't know about you, but if you can't stay up past 10 o'clock and then still get up for work the next morning, like, that's just on you. Because even if you go to bed at 11 o'clock... You have to get up at 6? You're still getting 7 hours of sleep. I don't know how much sleep you guys need, but seven's more than enough for, for me at least. So, I saw people complain about that. NASCAR could have moved the start up to 7 o'clock uh, without, you know, um, without having to notify people 24 hours in advance. And there's only like a 50% chance of rain going into Sunday, so that's why they didn't move it up a full hour to 6.20. So if they move it up 20 minutes, we get what? Another maybe... 30 laps of racing in would have been nice like don't get me wrong it would have been beneficial and would have been more interesting but yeah I guess they did what they could right I, I don't have major complaints over it it just is a bummer because it was a pretty intense race up to that point dudes were making moves left and right it's a weird type of racing I saw Nick Yeoman from IndyCar Radio and I think a lot of us have had the same sort of thoughts on it he said it looks a lot like the old IRL pack racing. And it does. It's very momentum-based. You don't want to lift, but you can get big runs from time to time. I'll say this, though. As Atlanta ages, this was the fourth race, second year of this new configuration. This surface is aging fast. Marcus Smith said that they used a type of asphalt that was going to age, and he was not wrong. This track will age pretty quickly, and I'm interested to see how NASCAR handles that into the future because... As this track ages and the surface gets more abrasive and handling becomes more of a premium, you can't keep the cars packed up for an entire run. Uh, and we started to see it happen this week, or yeah, this weekend, where cars were quickly realizing that the top was the best, right? You can make the bottom work, but the top was the predominant line because you could carry your momentum all the way around. It makes the corner longer, handling makes it a little bit easier. Uh, as this race ages, though, you're not going to be able to keep these cars packed up. Uh, the track service ages, rather. You're not going to be able to keep the cars packed up. And that'll be interesting to see how they approach it with the package going forward. Do we keep the super speedway package? Because a really strung out super speedway package race on a mile and a half probably isn't going to be great. It's going to look a lot like the 550 package. And 
I was not a fan of that. I know a lot of people weren't a fan of that. At the same time, I don't know if they go to the 670 package, the super, the uh, intermediate package. I think it could probably put on a pretty good race if it becomes a handling racetrack. So it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward. Obviously next year, I imagine for the next two years at least, they're going to try to keep going with this super speedway package. But yeah, it was different. The Xfinity race, we saw, I think, a glimpse of what the future is uh, for this track. And we'll get to that in a minute. But overall, let me look through my bullet points here on what I want to talk about. William Byron obviously wins his fourth race of the season. Um, Brad Keselowski comes up just short once again. He's going to get a win, right? He uh, led 19 laps Sunday night. William Byron also led 19 laps. That was weird. Eric Almarola led 46. Chris Buescher, 39. And Ryan Blaney led 20. William Byron wins the race. Daniel Suarez finishes second trying he was trying to be the uh, third track house car in a row to win which would have been a pretty wild stat aj allmendinger finishes third his best finish of the season michael mcdowell finishes fourth i believe that's also his best finish of the season as well kyle bush fifth brad Kozlowski sixth jj yale gets his first top 10 since was it 2008 maybe not eight 2012 i'm looking right now hang on a second Nope, it was 2008. God dang. No, that was top five. First top ten since 2013. I was about to be like, holy crap. That's a long time. But good for him. Good for that uh, uh, Rick Ware team. Top ten runs are always nice for them. Justin Haley gets his second consecutive top ten finish. Ryan Blaney ninth and Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in tenth. Austin Cendrick looked pretty strong early, led ten laps. He looked like he might be a contender. Chase Elliott just never really got up to the front where he needed to be. Denny Hamlin had a pretty quick car, faded. Joey Logano looked really good early, led the 11 laps, and then he just got shuffled out and just couldn't do the same things he did in the spring there, which I guess is probably pretty good because he stunk up the show pretty bad uh, back in the spring. And then we had Ross Chastain get caught up in a wreck, Kyle Larson as well, and Austin Hill. All three of those were DNFs. I saw Ross Chastain's interview where he was like, yeah, I didn't run full throttle a single time, single lap this weekend, which is perplexing because he qualified. So that's a little weird. But either way, pretty solid weekend of racing for the Cup Series. I'm, again, I'm really interested to see how it looks when they go back. There were 18 lead changes and 4,900, oh, let's call it 40, or no, 5,000 green flag passes, which don't really mean anything. There were 20 lead changes for the spring race, uh, 6,000 passes. 27 lead changes for the summer race last year, uh, 4,600 lead changes, and 46 lead changes back for the first event at this racetrack. So the spring race <clears throat> has had wildly different outcomes, at least in terms of competitiveness. Summer race seems to be sort of on the same path with that. So. Overall, pretty decent weekend of racing for those guys. On to the Xfinity Series. John Hunter Nemechek picks up another win this season. College cars, once again, looked like they were going to win the race. And in typical college fashion, they did not win the race. They Well, maybe they'll get a 1-2-3 finish someday, but it didn't happen this weekend as their cars decided to, once again, not work with themselves, with each other. Justin Haley said that he couldn't work with Daniel Hemrick there at the end because he was running out of gas. Yet, he kept his foot in the throttle and tried to pass the 11 car uh, multiple times, but didn't want to get behind him and try to push him because his car was sputtering. Which, if you're confused, I'm also confused by that because I think it was just Justin Haley wanting to go win the race and not help his teammate out who was racing for the points. In typical Daniel Hemrick fashion, though, he comes up short once again. He finished second on Sunday. Justin Haley finishes fourth when he was running out of gas. So I'm just not 100% believing what he was saying. But John Hunter wins, Daniel Hermick in second, Cole Custer third, Justin Haley fourth, Sam Mayer in fifth. Fun fact about Sam Mayer, and I think it's something that needs to be talked about, he is now the longest tenured JRM driver to never win a race. He has now gone 67 races without winning a race for the company. 
Michael Annette won in his 67th start for JRM, which means Sam Mayer's worse than Michael Annette now? It's very weird because Sam Mayer was viewed as a top two prospect, right? He was the Chevy answer to Ty Gibbs. And I'll be honest, he's not been the answer. He has actually not even really come close to being the answer. And it's perplexing. And as long as his parents keep writing a check, Junior Motorsports will keep bringing a car to the racetrack. But you have to wonder after a while, like, what's the payoff here? Will he ever actually be good? I'm not sure. He doesn't seem to, he doesn't, I mean, he won his truck series race, right? At Bristol with GMS in the 24 truck. He just doesn't seem to really possess that that killer mindset. That He doesn't close very well. He doesn't seem to be very aggressive. He's there. He's like running top 10, but he just never really seems to be in contention. And at a time last year when all of his teammates won, he didn't. And this year, only one of his teammates has won. But he's still just not really doing anything. And I think it's worth exploring in the offseason what the future is for Sam Mayer. Ty Gibbs finishes sixth. Kyle Sieg. P7, Parker Clearman, P8. Josh Williams comes back to Atlanta for a top 10 redemption after just parking it on the front stretch earlier this year. And Sammy Smith rounds out your top 10 for the Xfinity Series. You had a wreck. Sheldon Creed, Riley Herbs, Ryan Sieg, um, Brandon Jones, all caught up in incidents. I love racing reference because now they're not even like including what the, like who's involved in the cautions. They're just saying accident, turn four, accident, turn two. Racing reference. Let's get it together, boys. They never will. But I think the Xfinity race, though, and I put this in my notes, I think the Xfinity race, what we saw at the end of this race is likely going to be the future of Atlanta, where we saw like a seven or eight car breakaway. It looked a lot like super speedway racing in the 80s and early 90s where you get guys that just running in a single file line seven to eight of them and they would try to pass each other and it was pretty difficult and granted we saw the field get kind of jumbled up there at the end but it felt old school it didn't feel like a pack and i know the xfinity series isn't running their full super speedway package but at the same time i it handling became key and again, I think as we get along in the process with this race surface, handling is going to matter so much, we're going to see a lot more of this. And that's not a bad thing. Like, I'm I'm here for it, and I want to see I want to see handling, right? Like, I want to see drivers have to go out there and race, because right now, they're just keeping their foot to the floor or just lifting and not having to do a ton um, in, in retrospect. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens going forward. But for right now, it's um, interesting to say the least in terms of what we're getting out of this uh, package and this racetrack. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens going forward. But I liked what I saw from the Xfinity race. John Hunter winning doesn't really affect the playoffs that much. Let's pull up the NASCAR Xfinity Series playoff standings. Playoffs? Um, let's get this going right here. The Xfinity current playoff standings for the Xfinity series. No offense to William Byron, but you're not my Xfinity guys. All right, John Hart Nemechek is leading the way in the playoff standings for the Xfinity series. He has 2,034 point, points if the rate or if the playoffs were to start today. Austin Hill in second, Cole Custer in third, Justin Allgaier in fourth, Chandler Smith in fifth, Sammy Smith in sixth. Jeb Burton, 7th, Josh Berry, 8th, Sam Mayer, 9th, Sheldon Creed, 10th, Daniel Hemrick, 11th, and Riley Herps rounds out your 12 contenders. Parker Kligerman is the first driver out. He has he is 6 points below the cutoff line. Brett Moffitt is 53 points below the cutoff line, and Brandon Jones is 81 points below the cutoff line. I would argue that Brandon Jones and Brett Moffitt are in must-win scenarios. I don't see them outpointing their way in. Brandon Jones could win. We've seen him win before, but he just has not been, just hasn't looked very comfortable in that JRM number nine car this year. Outside of that, though, I think uh, I could see the Parker turning it on and getting ahead of Riley Herbst. Daniel Hemrick's plus 41 over the cutoff line right now, so that helps him. 
Sheldon Creed is plus 26 over the cutoff line. Uh, he could be in play, but right now, as it stands, because he has three stage wins this year, he's above Parker in terms of playoff points. So we'll see what happens. But it'll be interesting going forward to see sort of uh, how Parker can get this done. That car's fast enough to get it done, right? His two RCR de facto teammates are in the top 12. No reason he shouldn't be uh, right up there as well. So we'll see how that goes for him uh, as we march down the stretch here. There's seven races left in the Cup Series playoffs before um, we lock in 16 and go from there. All right, Truck Series race on Saturday afternoon into the early evening hours. Uh, from mid-Ohio, it rained, it downpoured. Uh, I'm in Cincinnati, and we also got rain. But the Truck Series had to wait it out. They went green and immediately went right back under yellow. They were green for 12 seconds, and then NASCAR said, oh, we can't see anything, throw the caution back out. Why they thought they could go green, I'll never understand, because, uh, like I said, it was very wet. It was insanely wet. But they still went green. The race was two hours and 46 minutes. It ran into Xfinity qualifying. Uh, there was a Reds-Brewers game that was supposed to come on FS1 after it. I'm pretty sure they were in like the fifth inning by the time the race ended. It was a marathon in terms of a truck series race. Corey Heim picks up his third win of the season, I believe. Um, he gets it done. Zane Smith comes in second for the, I don't know, third year in a row here or something like that. He picked up, Corey Hine picked up his second win of the season. My apologies. He won Martinsville earlier in the year, finished second at Kansas, and then uh, also missed the race already, too. So, Hine picks up the win. Zane Smith comes in second. Christian Eck is third. Uh, Stuart Fries in fourth. Ben Rhodes fifth. Matt Crafton sixth. Matt Crafton was all over the place. Spun out off the nose of uh, Marco Andretti at one point. I believe he was also off track again, so great rebound for him. Ty Majeski looked good early. Uh, also ran into some issues. He finishes seventh. Matt DiBenedetto, 8th, Nick Sanchez, ninth, and Tyler Ankrum, your ARCA winner on Friday night, rounds out your top 10 in 10th. Uh, notables, Marco Andretti finishes P19, Connor Daly P18. Uh, they both looked competitive when it was dry, or at least Marco did. He qualified 7th. The rain caught him out. Then he also spun out, avoiding a wreck coming out of the keyhole, spun into the grass, Incredible truck control by Marco to not let the truck come back out onto that backstretch and get absolutely clobbered by somebody because it's a truck series and you know no one's lifting, so they would have absolutely driven through him. Got lucky there. Um, great car control. Got the car going back again. Unfortunately, just got mired back there. And then with the truck series, the way the truck series is, he just never really could get back to where he needed to go through him off strategy. But said he'd be back. And it'll be interesting to see if he does come back and in what capacity. Obviously, we sort of talked about the potential of Andretti and Spire maybe working behind the scenes to get in the Andretti name, at least into the NASCAR ownership realm. Uh, not 100% sure if that's going to happen. Got a DM from somebody that said that uh, they were told by people at Andretti that it wasn't happening. Maybe. Um, we'll see what happens, though, going forward. But Connor Daly struggled with power steering issues, both in practice and qualifying and also in the race. Just bad luck Connor strikes again, right? Um, but he did have, obviously, track time from the week prior, so that's good. Overall, though, uh, the Truck Series race was pretty entertaining. The wet weather, we had people spinning, multiple people crashing before the race even started. I think uh, the 35 of Jake Garcia, he... That guy spun out no less than at least half a dozen times. He spun out, I think, twice under caution, maybe even coming to the green. I can't remember. But he spun out a ton, which was kind of embarrassing for him. Lawless Allen, he's uh, just one of the dumber people out there. I don't even know how to be nice about it. He spins out coming out of on the backstretch, right? So he spins out. Goes through the gravel trap that's there to slow you down so you don't end up on to the other side of, like, the through turn one, that straightaway that leads up to the keyhole. Slides through that gravel, gets it going, and then tries to go back through the gravel trap, even though he could have just driven around it, got stuck in the gravel. 
So he gets just beached in the gravel because he's Lawless Allen and he doesn't follow any of the rules. So physics don't even matter to him. Unfortunately, they should because he brought out a caution because, again, he's dumb. That was one of the more perplexing things. Taylor, or Tanner Gray, sorry, I got my Gray brothers right. Tanner Gray had one of the best performances of his career, and it didn't actually result in a good finish for him at all, I don't think. He finished... Oh, boy. Where's Tanner at? There's Taylor. He finished 20th, but... He did power his way through two gravel traps, including China Beach, which was a very big gravel trap. It was the one that Simon Pagano went flipping through a weekend ago. He powered all the way through there. His engine's probably hurt pretty bad. He's got gravel everywhere in that truck. They're going to have to take it back and just shake it down for the next week to get all the gravel out of it. But two very impressive drives out of the gravel traps for him. And that's a career highlight for him, right? Uh, anytime you see those TikTok videos where they're like, fuck it career highlights of Tanner Gray. It's just going to be him driving out of the gravel trap because he's really done nothing else on the NASCAR side of things. But it was rather impressive. Matt Crafton's team had this. This is another reason why Matt Crafton should be super happy finished P6. Um, his team left him out on, on wet weather tires. The track was very much dry. The entire field pitted for uh, slicks under that caution period. His crew chief said, I'm leaving you out. Because what's the worst that could happen? We fall back to where we were running at? Yeah, that's the worst that could happen, and that's pretty bad. So they did the Mercedes 2021 Hungarian Grand Prix strategy with him and left him out there uh, amongst a just absolute field full of animals that were on slick tires just wanting to eat him alive, and they did. And when the next caution came out, his crew chief was like, I got to bring you in and put slicks on. Yeah, dude, should have done that in the first place. But he was able to rebound for a top six finish, which is pretty damn good. But it was just funny to see him as the only truck sitting out there because they were non-competitive pit stops this week. The only truck sitting behind the pace car uh, on that straightaway just like, well, this is going to suck for me. So overall, truck race, pretty solid. Moving on to the Xfinity race at Silverstone, not Xfinity. The Formula 1 race at Silverstone, if Xfinity's race at Silverstone, were all there. Unfortunately, they were not. And it was the Max Verstappen show once again. Picks up his sixth win in a row. I was listening to Drake's back-to-back, -back, and he was like back-to-back -back, like the cover of a Lethal Weapon. And I was trying to think of like Max going back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back -to -back -to -back. That might have been six. That could have been seven backs. I'm not sure. I'm not going to go back and count. But if it was, I was like, what's the mo what movies have gone six movies? Is there a Lethal Weapon six? I don't know. But then Rocky was the only thing that came to mind. So if you heard that reference earlier, Lethal Weapon film series. How many Lethal Weapons are there? No, that's a TV series. All right. No, I want the whole thing. Why would you not... For other uses of Lethal Weapon? No, no, no. I wonder if that term's going to get picked up. No, I'm not thinking of Lethal Weapon, guys. I'm thinking of... Yeah, Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3, Lethal Weapon 4. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking of... What am I thinking of? This is not good. This is not good radio. I know it's not. But now I gotta look. There's a Lethal Weapon finale that's gonna come out? It's in development? Are you kidding me? No, I'm thinking of, and I gotta look this up before I sound like a complete fool. In terms of like long running movie franchises, I'm thinking of Beverly Hills Cop, but still, there's only four of those too, so I'm an idiot. So, Rocky stands. All right, that was an adventure. I'm glad we were all here to do it together. But that was uh, where my brain was at, which is a weird spot for my brain to be. Either way, Max pick up his sixth win. Lando and McLaren. So Mika Hakkinen, like a month ago, said that uh, at Silverstone when McLaren brought their upgrades, they would have speed that could contend with Red Bull. And everybody was like, ha ha, that's funny, Mika. Like, I'm glad that you're supporting your old team, but that's just never going to happen. It's like uh, that um, that clip going around where, I think isn't it David Coulthard is like back in 20, or no, 2010? I think, where he said that Red Bull was going to win the Constructors title on uh, BBC with Jake Humphrey's hosting. Shout out to uh, Jake Humphrey, one of the all-time 
wish he would have stayed in Formula One, guys, because he was rather entertaining. But I understand soccer pays more. Football, rather, but we call it soccer. It's called soccer. Uh, pays more. So I get that. But having said that, I think everybody kind of laughed when Mika said that. And then they come out and they go 2-3 in qualifying, and everyone's like, well, shit. I guess they're for real. And they ended up getting a podium. Lando finishes second. Oscar finishes fourth. Lewis, benefactor of that VSC, finishes third. Uh, great day for the Brits. Unfortunately, that Belgian won again. Uh, so that wasn't great. But overall, pretty solid weekend of pretty solid race, rather. No protesters. Those stop oil idiots didn't run out on the track. That was great. Tons of police presence. They were standing in the gravel trap, which had me wondering. Uh, not during the race. They were standing in the gravel trap uh, during the pre-race ceremonies, which had me wondering, like, I kind of wanted one of them just to jump over the fence and try to run out on the grid because, like, watching anybody try to run through a gravel trap, pretty hilarious. And just watching all of these security guards, no offense to the Brits, these, these portly fellows that are just eating fish and chips and fucking beans on toast for breakfast trying to run through gravel together would have been rather funny. Wish we could have seen it. Glad that the protesters didn't make it out there, though, because... I'm just tired of the stop oil protest people, especially in England, like, don't do it. There's better ways to protest. Uh, you had the full safety car period when Kevin Magnuson's engine expired, I believe on the Wellington Strait. Why that wasn't a full safety car right from the beginning, I'll never understand, because he got out of his car on a hot racetrack when it was just a local yellow before the VSC even came out, super dangerous. He's not at an access point. So you're going to have to send marshals out onto a live racetrack during a VSC. Again, super dangerous. That should have been a full safety car just from the beginning. I understand it's not a big crash, but just from a safety standpoint, that didn't make any sense. Still not a fan of VSC, though. Um, if you have to have a safety car period, just have a safety car period. They did feel like they just really milked that safety car, too. Good Lord. And then um, pre-race, you had Martin Brundle getting himself into a little bit more hot water as he went up and tried to interview... Cara Delevingne, if I believe I pronounced that name correctly. She's a model slash actress. She was in the show Only Murders in the Building on Hulu, if you've ever seen that, season two, rather. Uh, other than that, I looked through her filmography and did not recognize anything else. But she had like 9 million Instagram followers, so she's famous to a lot of people. He goes up and tries to interview her. What appeared to be one of her, her assistant or publicist Somebody told me that it was a Formula One publicist. Could have been an Alfa Romeo PR person as well, because I believe she was there as a guest of Alfa. Alfa loves to give models uh, press passes, or VIP passes. They love to give out paddock passes to models, which, good for them. But, so the PR person, you know, tells Martin, no, 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 you can't interview him. And Martin, being Martin Brundle, is like, okay, fuck off, and just proceeded to walk through him, and then goes up and tries to interview her. She politely, like, told him no, which is fine. If you don't want to be interviewed, say no. You shouldn't have to do anything you don't want to. No means no, right? So, like, that should have been the end of the conversation. Martin continue, continued to be persistent, which he is persistent with a lot of people, right? Even if he's in a weird situation like calling Paolo Banchero, Patrick Mahomes, he still proceeds to try to talk to them, even though he made a major, like, mess up. Megan the Stallion, again, awkward situation, tries to talk to him. He proceeded to try to talk to her. She wouldn't give him anything. And then he was like, I'm sure it would have been extremely interesting. And then turned around and walked away. And again, I can see both sides of the argument, right? She could have just been like, oh, like, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I hope whoever wins. I hope Valtteri wins or whatever. At the same time, if she doesn't want to talk, she doesn't have to talk. And Martin's saying, if you're on the grid, you have to talk. Everyone on the grid has to talk. That's not true. Uh, I've seen Martin get turned down by a number of people, high-profile people, and he didn't really throw a hissy fit or anything there. So I hope Sky doesn't get rid of the grid walk. It is wildly entertaining, and it is usually rather funny. Um... But maybe just have Martin stick to people that he knows. I don't know. Or I don't know how the best way to go about it. You can't really like have them wear like a little symbol or anything that's like, oh, this person's free to talk, like a green light versus red light type of situation. But again, like I think we're probably talking more about the Martin Brundle thing than we are the actual racing. And there's some pretty decent racing, especially mid-pack. Once again, mid-pack seems to be where it's at. And uh, yeah, it was a uh, overall... 
enjoyable race. One of the more enjoyable races of this season so far. And hopefully McLaren can continue their development path. Like, I'd love to see them contend. They were on pace to lose by, like, 10 seconds, 10 to 12 seconds maybe, which is less than everybody else has been so far. So that's a step in the right direction. Uh, Lewis and Mercedes know that they're in the right direction. They just need to work on the rear end of their race car. And once they get that figured out, he says that he's going to be good to go. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes going forward. But overall, that's all I've got for this week. We have the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series in New Hampshire next weekend. They'll also be testing uh, after the race. Six drivers will be staying back for a two or staying there for a two day test where they'll be testing a new front splitter, which is supposed to help in dirty air and lift the car in clean air, if I read that correctly, or something of that nature. They'll also be testing a number of other aero changes, none that will be implemented this year, which is a bit unfortunate considering the championship race is at Phoenix once again, but hopefully it is helpful for next year. I am glad that they updated the drivers participating because at first it was just Justin Haley. Um, it was Justin Haley, Christopher Bell, I believe, and Harrison Burton. No offense to two of those three, but they're not exactly who I would have picked. But William Byron is also staying back for the test. And I can't remember who the other four driver is, but um, no offense to Harrison Burton. Somebody that's just a little bit more uh, accustomed. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and now threads at BreakHardBlog. Like and subscribe to the channel. Talk to you guys later.